in the blood service, my role is mainly around clinical governance, um, looking after medical officers within the uh, within the blood service. So it's a clinical governance role. I also help manage the therapeutic program that the blood service runs, and I've been involved in that since we started with the therapeutic app back in 2013. And I'm also involved in looking after the medical medical microbiologists within the blood service, as well as doing some other policy work. Um, by way of context, I was a general practitioner for many years before um, before I went into medical management, and then I worked as a director of medical services at Charles Gardner Hospital, and also for the health department in WA Health Department. So I've been involved in medical management as well as in frontline general practice as well. Well, when I was a GP, I was particularly interested in sports medicine, but my main uh, is family medicine, really, and in in, in that. Um, in that role, we did see people with hemochromatosis, iron overload disorders, liver problems and so on that we needed to investigate. So, uh, you know, that's been an interest. And uh, since I've been with the blood service, uh, hemochromatosis, iron overload disorders, how they're managed and how we manage them at the blood service have been important. Yeah, well, I think it's important because we provide a national service. So... Uh, People in most places can access our facilities. Um, we provide a standardised approach to the um, to the management and assessment of people who who are referred to us with hemochromatosis or other iron overload disorders. And it's important for for patients themselves because we have a very skilled uh, staff group of staff who do phlebotomy all the time and understand you know the anxieties and so on that go with that. So they're likely to be able to have a comfortable experience donating blood at, at our centres. We have at least 40,000 therapeutic donations a year and we receive maybe 4,500 new referrals a year from general practitioners and specialists who are registered with our app. So um, all, all that adds up to quite a significant amount of, uh, of blood provided for our community. 40,000 uh, donations, of which we use a fair proportion, contribute about 4% of the red cell supply for the Australian community. So it's, um, it's a growing group within, uh, within the blood service because a donor will stay as a, as a donor, therapeutic donor probably for most of their life, if not all of it. Absolutely. We're, we're very grateful that they come and donate with us, uh, should they be um, suitable donors at, at, our, at our facilities. And I think in the main, uh, they're very happy with uh, the service that we can provide. I suppose the other thing is they can move around Australia and still come to our, our centres, and a lot of them are older people who do a fair bit of travelling and, and can donate at any one of our centres, all, all of which are linked up to the same, um, same computer system so people can see what they need to see when, uh, when running through a donation. Uh, no, um, what, what we would do is um, test the eligibility of each donor as they come, or each patient in this case, as they come to our centres. If they meet the donor safety requirements, of which we have quite a few, they can donate. And in the case of a therapeutic donor, they have to meet the product safety requirements as well for us to use their their uh, blood to make blood and blood products. So it, in the main, we use probably about 80% of therapeutic donations to contribute to the, um, the blood product and blood supply of Australia. People who can't come to us um, are people who've got significant medical problems in the main, and you know, our facilities aren't manned by medical staff, they're manned by nurses and trained health professionals, so we don't provide a medical service per se, and these um, therapeutic donors are looked after by their own doctors from, from the medical perspective, not, not by us. No, they shouldn't do that. They should go online and look up uh, high ferritin. If they search for high ferritin, uh, or go to high ferritin, Dot transfusion .com, uh, they will find the app. They can use it on their computer or their smartphone or tablet. Um, they'll be taken through a series of questions on the app and if their patient meets our therapeutic criteria, they'll be um, asked to put in some demographic details and from there, if, if they're approved, a notification to our contact centre will be made on their behalf and we'll organise some appointments for their patient. So it's very straightforward. 
volunteer donors can only give blood every three months, um, and we do that for donor safety reasons and to protect them from iron loss. Therapeutic donors are usually iron overloaded, so they can often donate even weekly to start off with until we get their ferritin under control. And, and the process is designed by their doctor who tells us what schedule of venesection um, they should undertake and monitors their ferritin. As their ferritin comes down, their venesection schedule will be um, less frequent. Well, it's a lifelong illness, so generally, if uh, until, they're, um, un until they can't donate any more for other medical reasons. So they tend to end up doing three monthly or six monthly donations for most of their life. And their doctor would be monitoring their ferritin at all times to see if they needed further um, or more increased frequency donations. Philosophically, no, but if they became unwell with other problems that might be uh, of higher importance, then, then perhaps they, they shouldn't. Uh, come in. So as people get older often they develop other things that might prevent them from donating blood and often they might be more serious than, than the need to continue to donate for hemochromatosis purposes. And as they get older they're not likely to accumulate iron uh, to the extent that that could cause tissue damage in the same way as they would over a long period of time if they uh, left their donations at a younger age. There, there are times where we can't accept people, particularly people who've got uh, viral illnesses that could be transmitted uh, by blood, such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, and um, they're also dangerous from a staff health perspective to have people with transmissible illnesses in, in our centres. We also won't take people who have significant medical problems because, as I've mentioned, we're not a medical facility and uh, we don't want to put donors at risk. True, although we will take some people with haemochromatosis that we wouldn't take as volunteer donors because we can discard their blood. And they're people, for example, who have our uh, famous CJD deferral for people who've lived in the UK since between 1980 and 1996. Those people can't come to us as volunteer donors, but we will accept them as therapeutic donors and discard their blood. The challenges include, uh, you know, venesection can cause problems, they, they can faint, that's quite a common problem with venesection, they can develop problems around where the phlebotomy is done, you know, not commonly, but these things do occur. Um, with regard to early treatment with haemochromatosis, people often have to come in frequently and we still have to go through the exact same process each time, which includes a donor questionnaire, doing all the mandatory blood tests and so on. So there's a, a little bit of process involved with each donation, which sometimes is frustrating for people who come in frequently, particularly weekly or two weekly in their first um, set of donations. Well, I think they're, they're shared by our volunteer donors who come for the first time, which include, uh, you know, fear of fainting, I think, is a common one. Fear of needles is common. You know, some people are needle phobic, so those people uh, are worried about how much it might hurt, um, which in general it, it doesn't hurt a great deal. Um, convenience is an issue. You know, sometimes people are worried about how much time it's going to take, how long they're going to be held in the donor centre afterwards, those, those, sort of, um, those sort of things. I mean, basically, blood donations are very safe, um, relatively painless and, and most people find it quite rewarding and enjoyable because they know that their products are going to be used for the good of the Australian community. The High Ferritin app um, was designed as a consequence of us noting that paper referrals were very time consuming for us and doctors um, and they took us a long time to, to manage and they were often managed differently in different states by different doctors who would be assessing them. So there was a bit of inconsistency around our approach to them. And there was no underlying um, evidence-based approach from a, from a process point of view that made sure that we were only taking people who really did have uh, a reason for therapeutic venesection. So um, we designed the app on the basis that that would streamline um, referring doctors uh, life by, by taking out a fair bit of paperwork and also um, allowing an evidence-based algorithm to, to sit behind the app so that um, all the work was done in the app and, and it wasn't uh, a, 
a doctor at the blood service having to reassess um, each, each um, referral on its merits. And what's, what that's done for us is allow us to deal with all therapeutic donors on a, on a, no matter where they are in Australia on a, in a standardised and evidence-based way. Um, we've allowed the turnaround time to be massively improved so they get their appointments within 48 hours generally of, of the referral, whereas in the past it took us a while to get through all the work. Um, it means that certainly doctors have a much easier life. Um, their patients have an easier life because they hear about their outcome more quickly and our, our people have a much easier life because we don't have to assess lots of paper referrals. Yeah. And the community benefits as well because we've, we're encouraging blood donation and um, the products are mainly used for the, for the good of the community. Accessing the High Ferritin app, you can just Google High Ferritin and it will come up or go to transfusion.com.au and it's, it's on the front page of that uh, website, which is our website for doctors and, and hospitals. With regards to the research side of things, the apps also allowed us to be involved in research, by the way, because doctors can um, enrol their patients in research that is particularly targeted at particular types of hemochromatosis that we may have researchers using our app to assist with. So that, that's one, one side of the app we haven't mentioned where we're facilitating research into hemochromatosis. Um, I think the things that have come through in recent years, and one of the main ones is the safety of using blood products from haemochromatosis patients to make blood products for our community. And there was a publication which demonstrated that therapeutic donations from Australian blood donors are at least as safe and probably safer actually uh, in terms of uh, infectious diseases and so on than, than from volunteer donors. And that was published in the, the journal Transfusion. And it, accompanied by an editorial which encouraged other countries to follow our example of using blood and blood products from haemochromatosis patients, which it isn't currently done in a lot of places. So, so that, was, um, that was quite a, a, a big uh, win for, the, for, for our approach to, um, to therapeutic venesection. I guess the other sorts of research we've been doing lately include um, looking at the very frequent donations that we do in the first um, when people are first referred and they need to come in weekly or so on, occasionally what happens is their haemoglobin can drop. Usually we don't take people whose haemoglobin is under a certain threshold, but we, we have done with therapeutic donors because we want to remove iron. And we've just done some research to show that that is a safe approach and it's in, in the publication process at the moment. So that, that may be a, another um, useful um, piece of work that, that demonstrates that you know, what we've been doing is actually safe and reasonable, even though you know, we've never had a problem with it, but we, we'd like to have it supported by evidence, and that's, that's what we, we now have. And I guess the other bit of, of research that has, um, has been um, important lately has been the, um, the use of red blood cell indices by general practitioners to be um, alerted to the fact that there may be uh, it may be worth looking for hemochromatosis in a patient. So as a sort of uh, a screening test rather than just relying on ferritin to look at um, MCV, MCHC and MCH, which, which are red cell indices that doctors do very, very regularly and, and sometimes, um, you know, sometimes there's an underlying reason why those might be abnormal, but recently we've shown that they are quite sensitive and, and specific for haemochromatosis, so it may, it may be worth them considering looking at the, the, um, the gen genetics in people that they see abnormalities in those indices. We do collect data about the frequency of donation and send reminders through our system when donors, patients need another referral and maybe another assessment of how their ferritin level is going. So that's one side of it that helps doctors keep a track of their, their patients. At the moment, unfortunately, we haven't been able to uh, set up a system where we can share all of our data um, with, with referring doctors, but we, we have been looking into um, the use of My Health Record for, for that purpose, and perhaps that's something down the track that may be of use. 
Well, one thing I'd really like to do is to help GPs by integrating our, our app into their software systems so that they would have less work to do uh, when it comes to populating with past history, demographics and so on. And we have been looking at that to a certain extent, but uh, again, that might be a little bit down the track. I, I think that's, that's something that would make a big difference. We're constantly refining the app based on GP feedback as well. So, I mean, we encourage people to let us know if there's a, a, an improvement that they can see that we, we could potentially um, implement. We often do, uh, but usually the people with haemochromatosis that we see have already uh, come to the conclusion that they should be involved with Hemochromatose Australia. It's often for people who come in and haven't yet been fully assessed and we refer them back to their doctors and, and to Hemochromatosis Australia um, for, for assistance. So, you know, new new patients, new or potential new patients, we would refer. Um, yeah, but we have quite a close relationship with Hemochromatosis Australia and we appreciate their support and, uh, and we you know, like to interact as much as possible with them in terms of where research is heading, how we can assist their, their um, people become uh, patients with us.